Awesome. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Caitlin Smith, your webinar host from Main Street ROI. We're very excited to be having another of our Master Your Marketing series where we bring together leaders in the digital marketing world to bring you great content focused on ways that you can grow your business. This series is sponsored by all of our partners, Active Demand, Blue Rank, Optimizer, Lucky Orange, Likeable Local, and Hello Bar. For today's webinar, we're excited to welcome Danny Weitzman, COO and founder at Lucky Orange. The presentation will be about 40 minutes so that we can leave plenty of time at the end for a live Q&A session. Feel free to type any questions that you have in the Q&A box along the way. Actually, if you could also type them in the chat box, we're doing a little switch up today. Um, that would be great. And then we'll get back to all the questions at the end of the webinar. As always, today's webinar will be recorded and we'll send out a replay video along with the PDF of the slides to everyone who has signed up. So if you get calls or are pulled away for work, don't worry, you're not going to miss a thing. So with that, I'll turn the webinar over to Danny so he can get started. Hey, thank you, Caitlin, for that amazing introduction. And I um, really appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak with you, um, everyone today. So yes, today we are going to speak about Tinder, Spinster, and JSwipe, the seven hacks we learned from using these apps to improve website conversions. So uh, as we go through this presentation, and really with any wide audience like this, there's going to be a wide range of expertise. So my goal is always to have for every no shit moment, we're going to have a couple oh shit moment too. So I promise there's going to be a wide range of information we're going to copy uh, and go over. So let's jump right into it with uh, a few disclaimers about this uh, presentation. The first is that I am happily married, or so my wife tells me. Uh, during this uh, research for this project, uh, we couldn't help but catfish a few friends of ours to, again, better understand how these dating apps work. And then whether you're on a dating app or dating visitors to the site, your website, we're going to teach you how to master the art of closing the deal. Oh, and full transparency, that won't be our last shameless pun. So let's start with a refresher or overview of the dating apps for the unlucky few that have never been able to participate with these. Let's pick a uh, service here. In this case, we'll, we'll take Tinder. Once you sign up for the service, uh, you have the opportunity to fill out a short bio and upload a photo. You then begin to see photos of potential matches. If you're not interested in making a match with this person, you simply swipe to the left. If you are interested in being a match with this person, you simply swipe to the right. If both you and the other person swipe right on each other, then congratulations, you become a match and you guys can go off, get married, create a lot of Bayside babies together. Now a study was done to determine <clears throat> how long it takes to make a first impression. The study concluded that when judging a person solely based on a photo, it took roughly a tenth of a second. Now, as shocking as this might be, a similar study was done for website first impressions, and the results showed that website first impressions can often be decided in half that amount of time. Now, in this digital age, we are often solely reliant on our website to help build rapport and trust especially with first time visitors, even before we've had a chance to have dialogue with them. So we're going to focus this presentation on a few tips and tricks we can all use to identify what might be barriers to a positive site visit and ultimately help turn more visitors into customers. Oh, and for those of you who did turn in for the dating app tips, don't worry, we're going to pepper in some of those here and there too. So let's jump in and talk about what we can do to maximize that first impression, both in life and on our websites, and make them want to swipe right. A lot of this section, we're going to deal with the images we decide to use, because as we're all aware, what visitors see on our sites is one of the best ways they orientate themselves and then decide where to go from there, assuming they even stay on our site. So special thanks to our friend Bill for showcasing how two different images of the same product can drastically change your perspective and interest level. And this brings up a fun experiment of a real life test that was done on choosing the right profile image for dating apps. Here we have Robert. And in this study, 
Robert uploaded two different photos to see if women would swipe right, indicating that they are interested more on photo number one or photo number two. Um, if you'd like, you can take a guess right now in the chat section. Okay, I'm seeing some people come in. Some people think it's number one, a more casual, a few people suggesting number two. Okay, so interesting enough, the respondents indicated that they prefer number two. And that's because they appreciated uh, that the photo was in black and white. It was a more buttoned up look, which made them seem more successful. Uh, also, they indicated that the eye contact looking away from the camera almost gave a sense of confidence, which they appreciated. Uh, another thing is that in photo number one, his eyes were covered by his sun sunglasses. Now they did ran a similar test, but this time for females. So here we have Laura. And in this experiment, they uploaded two different photos. Uh, again, one with a more buttoned up look and number two in a more casual poolside setting. Uh, so this one's probably fairly obvious, but which one do you think the guys preferred in this photo? Number one or number two? So a lot of people are instantly jumping on number two, but interesting enough, Number one was actually the winner, and the respondents often cited that they liked the idea of a more approachable girl or a picture that was not as cluttered with other people in it. And similar to the first case, they actually liked the eye contact looking directly at uh, the person in the photo. And a similar thought process actually carries over to our website and the visitors there, in that a recent study by Adobe showed that 38% of people will stop engaging immediately if they feel the website content or layout is unattractive. So Smart Wool Socks put this to the test with two new website layout designs. In both cases, the goal was to increase the average revenue per visitor. In version A, we see on the left here, they had a mix of some small and larger images and a large header on top. In version B, they had a more of a uniform looking grid and they decided to get rid of the header image. And immediately they saw that version B was the winner and they showed that uh, they had over 17% increase in return on their investment by simplifying this navigation and layout. And here at Lucky Orange, we tried a similar test it's because sometimes you don't know what your customers want. So on the left-hand side, we have our traditional Lucky Orange sign-up page that features a navigation and an explainer video. Uh, but we decided to create a new variation on the right-hand side that showed more logos of our clients because we thought it might credential the work we do. We also put a sign-up button right front and center there and even put a focus on our testimonials. But what the data actually showed us is that we got more signups from our traditional original version. And this is because what we realized is that people were more interested in what we do as opposed to who we did it for. So in this section now, in hack number two, let's focus on how we orientate our guests to our home. In this lesson, we can learn from both real life and how we can apply it to our website. Now, if you ever notice, one of the things we often do when welcoming guests to our home is explain to them where everything is. We tell them things like, you can hang your coat over here. The kitchen is back there. Uh, the bathrooms are right in, down this hallway. And we do this to help the visitor or guest feel welcome and at home. We also do this to avoid any uncomfortable situations where they might need to quickly ask for help and they don't know where to go. And a quick fun fact for those of you thinking the inside of that home looks familiar and that they recognize it, uh, it is in fact the Home Alone house, which I think actually recently sold in Chicago. So let's look at another real life example of how a client of ours, Taylor Made Golf, looked to change their home to help the guests find what they were looking for. Here we have their old website design. It featured a single call to action right on the image, uh, relied a lot on sub navigation, which can be challenging because oftentimes you don't know what you're looking for and you have to explore a lot of sub nav to find all the options. And there also wasn't a singular focus on the product they actually sell. So they updated their website homepage to feature this new design. Here we can see they had multiple call to actions. Their products got put front and center and on display right there for you, for you to see. 
but they put a nice feature of their tailor-made players on the site. And they also expanded the nav bar. So here they are side to side, so you can see the before and after. And immediately they saw a nice lift on traffic and click-through rates on this first site. And to validate how people were interacting with it, they decided to launch dynamic heat mapping and the orange representing where people are clicking the most. And you can see a really nice distribution because people can jump right in and find exactly what they're looking for. And this also led to positive successes in both growth in their click-through rates, their conversions went up, and of course, bounce rates went down a lot, which was a really nice win for them. So up until this point, we've spent a lot of time talking about the images we use and how to lay them out, which is a really important step. But the other equally important part of that equation is getting feedback on the changes that we are implementing. But, all, but not all feedback is equal. And that's why getting the right feedback matters too. And I'll give you a perfect example of something that might happen to you all. And I know it certainly happens to me. You have that one friend, teammate, family member who you often ask for advice. The problem or challenges, are we asking the right people? For example, I know if I talk to my grandma about life, she is always going to tell me not to worry about anything, that I am the greatest person in the world, that I am so sweet, that I can do no wrong, and I shouldn't ever change a thing about me. And if I ever didn't make a team, didn't get a job, or um, didn't get a date, she would say, it's their loss, not mine, and nothing is wrong about me. My grandpa, on the other hand, well, that guy's a real straight shooter, and he would tell me like it is. So and that really illustrates the importance of who we ask for feedback is just as important as how we ask for it. Now, there are a lot of different ways to get this feedback and dialogue with visitors and customers on your site. And this is a really great example from a customer of ours. This is MyBaitShop.com. And just a little history of who they are. They're a Shopify merchant that launched back in 2017. They have a product line of over 20,000 fishing lures. And with that many products and SKUs, it can be a real challenge to understand which ones you should uh, focus and feature. And like many e-commerce stores, they struggled with a conversion rate lower than 1%. And without knowing what, what or why visitors weren't converting and why that conversion rate was so low, they decided to ask and go right to the source themselves, the visitors on their site. MyBaitShop.com launched a poll or a survey and asked their visitors what exactly they're looking for. They asked them, what additional lures would you like them to carry? And I love this because it's such a simple question, but the insights are tremendously valuable. In respondents with over 55% of them indicating that they want more vintage lures. And using this information, they made one simple change to the homepage to start featuring vintage lures. This allowed visitors to quickly access exactly what they wanted. And as a result, conversions jumped 450% in the first few months. And as a side benefit, traffic to the site grew as well, likely due to the uptick and lift from SEO and organic traffic. And this is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, as we check back in with Keith Bell, the owner of mybaitshop.com to see how things are going, he says the biggest struggle he has right now it's just keeping up inventory to meet demand. So this is the one problem we love to hear is that when sales grow so well, um, inventory is the biggest challenge. So here are a few simple examples of easy ways to get the right feedback from visitors based upon what is most important to you. For example, if your site is in e-commerce, simply asking, is there anything preventing you from checking out today? You might learn it's your pricing, it's your return policy, or some other confusion the visitors have. If you're in lead gen, you might have a very long form that requires a lot of information for you, but sometimes just a quick pop-up that says, hey, would you like to be contacted for a free estimate? And you can get a nice email submit right there, and oftentimes you're going to get way more email submits on a shorter form like that. Or maybe you're in UX, and you want to just simply know, how would you rate your experience today because you've launched a new checkout flow? All this information is a great way to get from surveys and polls on your site. 
And again, it's exactly getting the right feedback from the right people. So our fourth tip goes back to that old saying that hopefully you have never heard, but it's one of the greatest breakup lines of all time. And that it's, it's not you, it's me. Except here's the deal. For visitors to your website, it often is the reverse. It is you, not me. It is you, the website owner, not me, the visitor. Sometimes we just make it too hard for them to convert, even when they want to. Now, what I'm about to show you is a very simplified example, but it's based upon real life, real life activity we see daily across our sites. In this scenario, a business just launches a new site. Here, we're looking at Rover Scooter Company. They're very excited to get new traffic to their store, and it's all beginning to show up. And all that traffic is being sent to a simple sign-up form on this page. But despite 100 visitors coming to their site, only, they only received one sign-up. Again, representing about that 1% conversion rate that plagues a lot of sites. So they decide it's time to start making some changes. They change the call to action button from red to green. They add a big banner to encourage people to sign up. And at some point, they probably change the font to Comic Sans because they thought it'd make the site seem more friendly or approachable. And those of you who are in web design or work with agencies are probably kind of kicking themselves right now because this is something site owners come with all the time. They're like, oh, we need Comic Sans. It'll make more people sign up. Uh, so it's a real life scenario. But unfortunately, despite all these changes, they did get another 100 visitors and still keeping that very low sign up rate. So without any more content to change, Rover decides to take a deep dive into how visitors are interacting with the form itself using form analytics. In this form analytics section, in form analytics report, Rover can see that they are having really good interaction across the form, but a huge percent of abandonment is occurring at the phone number field highlighted in red. So again, in this scenario, we can see that there are a lot of people are engaging with the form itself, and that would be strange to think that you only have one sign up. But yet there is one field that's being highlighted in red indicating abandonment. Abandonment occurs when the visitor last types into a field, but then never converts. So doing a deeper dive, in this case, they found out they were getting abandonment on the phone number field because there was a form validation rule that they did not know about. What this meant to them was that people were trying to convert by entering their phone number in. The problem was the system kept saying it was an invalid phone number because this form validation rule said, unless you enter your area code with a parentheses around it, consider it invalid. But here's the trick. The form itself never indicated that that's how you had to enter the, your phone number on this field. So unless you're t someone would take the time to call you and say, hey, I'm trying to convert, I'm trying to purchase, most of us are just gonna hit the back button, go back to Google and click on the next link, which just might be your competitor. Now a form validation rule found with form analytics is just one of those gotyas that can happen on our forms. And a great thing about form analytics is you can run a report for any form on any page of your site. Now, an example we have here is from SmartBug, an agency partner of ours, who has a client who's in the senior assisted living communities. And they're trying to get more people to sign up to be contacted to take a tour of their facility. So they ran a form report on this sign up form here. They could instantly see which field is the offender causing friction. In this case, there was a lot of confusion and abandonment around a field that asks you to kind of classify yourself. And the question said, I am A, and then a drop down. And I think people had often had a hard time either picking one option because they felt they felt they landed in multiple buckets, or they didn't understand how dependent on what they picked led them to how they might be contacted. And to do a deeper dive, when they clicked on these form reports, they can actually drill in to watch anonymous user sessions 
or recordings of the visitors that struggled on this form. So we've just shown two different examples of abandonment, but that is just one type of form analytics report that's important. Other great form analytics reports will look at things like repeat fields, which will show you what fields are often most repeated. Uh, this might indicate that there's confusion or form validation rules or some sort of capture that was confusing. We have things like field time, and that looks at how long it takes to fill out those fields themselves. And are they significantly long fields uh, to show how long people are taking? And, it lets you know, can you shorten the field times themselves or maybe even make a drop down field itself. Another component is the order, which is how people fill out the forms. Now, this is really such a simple report, but it does tell you how people fill out the form in the sequential order. And it's not always exactly how we lay it out on, on the site. This is often due to autofill with our browsers where some fields will get field, filled out and some won't. Uh, because some people hit tab as they're filling out a form. So using this information, you can relay out the form itself and get a more optimized user experience and certainly help to grow conversions. Jumping right into Hack 5, it's all about knowing your target audience and understanding what they are interested in so you can increase your chances of making a connection. Now, this was an interesting fact, going back to dating apps for just a moment here, but a report in the New York Times showed that across many dating apps, men swipe to the right, indicating that they are interested nearly 50% of the time. Women, on the other hand, swipe to the right, indicating that they were interested in the men only about closer to 10% of the time. So understanding your target audience is key to success for example, if I were to upload my photo or my profile on JDate, which is a popular dating app for other Jewish people, I probably shouldn't choose to use this as my profile photo. Now, for many of you, this might be an oldie, but it, but it really is a goodie. So if you have been through this exercise before, uh, but maybe it's been a few years or it's completely new, it's definitely worth revisiting creating a buyer persona. Buyer personas are a great discovery process for better identifying your target customer profile. Let's say, going back to our earlier example, you have a site that works in senior assisted living or retirement communities. Well, oftentimes, one of the buyers or decision makers is not the person moving in, but the children of the senior looking to move. By understanding more about the drivers of this decision maker, who in this example we call Saving Sally, you can better understand how to message and where to market to them. For example, in this Saving Sally scenario, we say that Sally might have be working in her career as a mid-level executive, uh, she likes to spend some free time traveling or cooking and reading. Um, she might have worked for some sort of marketing or design agency. Uh, her goals in life is kind of interesting because based upon where she is in life, she may be looking to retire herself in the next two to five years, but she still has a lot of dependencies on her because she wants to make sure her parents are taken care of who she's trying to move into the senior assisted facility. But she might need to be, while she wants to save for retirement, she may also be financially supporting kids that are in college. So knowing that she's in this kind of saving mode, hence the name Saving Sally, is a good thing to keep in mind. But even all that, because she is an established professional, she probably does have some savings and some expendable income. And that we know she'll pay a premium for nicer amenities for her loved ones because she cares about them. And finally, we can uh, understand that she might use Facebook to catch up with friends, and probably does read a lot of financial blogs for tips and tricks. So what does this tell us, tell us? That as we're crafting our messages on our site or we're buying ads, maybe we might want to look at Facebook or financial blogs. In the pictures we use, we want to have messaging around that your parents will be loved and taken care of and that is a nicer facility and that we recognize that 
financially taking care of the people you love is very important to you, but it's not always the easiest thing. So again, we can speak directly to our audience and get more, have that intimate relationship with them by understanding this buyer persona. And a, a, another side tip about buyer personas is that there isn't one persona for your org. But by understanding your product and service, you can create a few different buyer personas that might help you when you do identify which person or which decision maker you're talking to, allows for a more informed sales team, a more informed marketing team, and really, again, helps you connect and create that one-on-one -on -one relationship um, with our customers. Uh, HubSpot, a great partner of ours, really has a really nice um, buyer persona template that we always like to include a link because um, it's one of the questions that always comes up if we talk about buyer personas is what do you recommend so, for how do I get started creating buyer personas? Uh, where should I go? So they have a really good um, generator right here. So I'll leave that slide up for just a moment. So throughout this presentation, we've talked about many different tools to help us understand our site visitors. But oftentimes, the challenge is where and which ones to start with. So which tools should I be using? How do I know which one's the right one for our organization? And I can tell you honestly, there is no magic bullet or answer to this question. Uh, but it is a really good opportunity to evaluate your organization's specific needs and do more of a deeper dive. Now, this is a very high level example, but a partner of ours, MKT4EDU, before they engage a client, they're going to really do more of a discovery process. Some of the questions they might ask are, do you need the analytics to integrate with other platforms you use? So maybe you're using a CRM. Do you want some of your data, maybe it's your session recordings, to show up in that CRM? Uh, is your data being sampled? Because if it is being sampled, then it might be a lot harder to gather the insights you're looking for quicker. So are you looking for sampled or uh, always on recordings or sessions or whatever you might be looking for? If you're interested in heat maps, how hard is it to run those heat maps? So the simplicity to run these technologies needs to be for, uh, front and center. So do you have to set up experiments? Or are the heat maps always generating data? Uh, also, are you looking for more of an all-in-one solution, or do you want specific tools that do specific functions? So again, this is just a scenario of how one organization will approach others to help them figure out which tools to that they recommend. And when I said earlier that there is no magic bullet or one solution for all, I mean it. This is a really high-level bird's-eye view of some of our tech stack here at Lucky Orange. And you can see, based upon where we place them in this customer lifecycle, we really do introduce new tools all the time. For example, when we're still at that early stage of attracting new users, we might do some keyword research with SEMrush or buying ads on Google PPC. Uh, as we bring them to our site, we might want to do things like looking at the uh, videos we create using Powtoons, and are we collecting their leads uh, and creating new landing pages with HubSpot? Um, once they have signed up and we're deciding to email them, are we doing it through different mailing platforms? And how does that mailer platform get tied into the, the different events of those users? And of course, once we do want to convert them on site, we're using our own tool, Lucky Orange, to engage with visitors via chat to help with both a sales and support initiative. And then post-conversion, we're going to do other ways. We're going to optimize the website and look at our Google Analytics so we can continue to fine-tune. So this is, a, again, a high-level view of just some of the things we can use. And I mean, when I said it, probably now for the third time, is there is not one solution that meets everybody's needs. But doing that discovery process, doing a deep dive, will allow you to figure out what's your best starting point. And again, don't start with every tool. You don't need every tool. Accomplish one goal, one need, and find the right tool that can help you with that. Because I can assure you, and something we're about to talk about right now, introducing tools to an organization is definitely more art than it is science. And that's really where I want to transition here, which is an area we call friends with benefits. And in this hack, it's more about um, a real world scenario, which a friend with benefit can just be someone who's there to lend a helping hand 
or weigh in on life and provide some support. But in our scenario uh, of website optimization, we like to look at your teammates and coworkers as your friends with benefits. And this is so important and often overlooked because as we were saying, you've taken the time to figure out all your department needs and you finally found the right tool or tools you're ready to start on. But here's the difficulty. We often don't share them. We brought in a tool because we said, what do we need as a marketing team that can help us do our jobs more successful? So we vetted it and we, we talked to lots of different vendors and we finally decided on the right tool for us. And then we're so excited in marketing to use it. But then all of a sudden we need something from another team. Now that we've learned something from it, we want another team to help us implement this. And they say, well, I don't know this tool. I'm not familiar with it. How can I trust it? And that's why we really stress the importance of cross training departments. The way someone in sales views and interprets a heat map is very different than the way someone in marketing or customer service might do it. Having these roundtable discussions provides team buy-in in a very clear direction for action. And this slide really highlights how different teams with entirely different focuses can still benefit from engagement with various tools and softwares. Let's look at um, session recordings here as an example. And for, as a quick refresher, a session recording is like having a DVR for your site where it will take anonymous user visits and aggregate them into recordings they can play back like a movie for your site. So when we're looking at session recordings, a sales member might want to look at a session recording of a visitor to see what products that person was interested in. So before they call that lead, they can say, hey, um, let's talk about this product and that product, and I can have those benefits ready to go so that way I don't go into that sales call very cold. Uh, developers might like to look at session recordings because they want to know, were there any JavaScript issues on the page? Was there any other technical glitches that came up that prevented the user from converting or at least made it significantly harder? Design teams will look at session recording and they'll see how the new layout that they just created and are the new images being interacted with. So it gives you a real sense of how one feature can be used across many different teams. And of course, this goes on and on for all these different functions. Chat's another good example because chat can be used as customer service, but it all can, also can be used as a sales aid. So maybe you're chatting with somebody and they want to start talking about pricing and quoting. Well, immediately you can transfer them to a sales team member. Um, developers can use the chat to have internal team communication and web design. So again, lots of different tools out there. But the most important takeaway here is when you are vetting your tools, think about and bring in decision makers from other different teams because you want to get them on board. And it's really going to simplify that when you do have that discovery and you find that really great change you want to make, that insight, having cross-team collaboration will really help push it through. So let's recap a few tips and takeaways here as we wind down. The first is remember that that first impression is very key. You have less than, sometimes less than a second to make it. You use heat maps, session recordings to identify where people are doing it. But the images we pick in understanding those interactions is a huge component of making that first impression work. So let's start with first impression. The second part of that is, let's think about our navigations. Are we displaying the buttons in an easy to read way? Are we um, laying out the content in many different ways that people have easy to find call to actions? So navigation and website is a huge key to conversion. The third tip that we covered was really about capturing feedback from the right users. And that's your visitors, both those that sign up, those that don't convert, and those that have been loyal with you for a long time. And one of the easiest ways to do that, as we saw, was through polls and live chat. Live chat is real-time dialogue with people on the site. Polls and surveys allows them to interact with you and make, help you make more informed choices. Maybe it's about the products or services you're providing, barriers of conversion and what didn't work well for them, and other great wisdoms that you can gain from them. Knowing your target audience also is key, and we saw this through creating buyer personas. And that allows you, again, to focus your marketing strategy, your brand messaging, your on-site content, even your sales decks to understand which type of buyer you're working with so you can be more informed and make that one-to-one -one connection a lot more early on in the process. 
And then as we just saw, utilize those teams to discuss and implement the findings. Teammates are critical and key to having this again, global team buy-in, and you will see how much happy the organization is when everybody's on board, everybody's excited. And the great thing about that is when you do have people excited to make these changes, they can't wait for the next one. When are we gonna meet on it again? When are we gonna discuss it? How about that change we made on Monday? Can we discuss how it's been going later that week? So you do see a lot of those things coming in. I know we moved through a lot of content here and for some of it might have been refreshed and some of it might have been brand new, but uh, I do want to sincerely thank you all for taking your time on this very busy day um, to st stay with me here. Uh, it, it is always an exciting opportunity to share some of the things we've learned and as we put these presentations together, just continue to see these common areas that come up and the frustration points that we all deal with, again, whether we're in e-commerce, lead gen, uh, brand building. So uh, a lot of this does hold true. So I want to thank you all very much for your time. Uh, as a special thank you, the team here at Lucky Orange does want to extend a free 30-day trial, no credit card required. If um, there's anything in our software that might be of help to you, uh, we do provide the session recordings of the heat mapping um, surveys. There are a lot of other tools that do a lot of good benefits, including those things too. So if you're not using us, but do find someone because this type of feedback is so critical for making these informed decisions. So we did include a link there so you can get a free 30-day trial. Our usual trial is about seven days, so this is a nice long time. We can get a whole month's worth of data and insights from them. So uh, again, I want to thank everybody's time and appreciate uh, everyone sticking around. Um, we'll stay around for some Q&A that we know has come in. Okay, so the first question that came in is, what is the best way to evaluate your website with heat maps? Uh, awesome, love that question because heat maps is so neat because it's such a visual aid. And you, we don't like people just only being in Excel and we, we really like when people have very visual learning tools. And I think heat maps is a huge component of it. And the simplest place to start with a heat map is just a scroll depth heat map. What a scroll depth heat map will tell you is how far down on any page are most visitors scrolling and where that effective fold or drop off might be. So this will tell you, did we bloat our pages too much? So did we load our page with too much uh, value propositions and bullets and testimonials? By the time we put all this content on the page, our call to action is so low that most visitors don't even see it. See it. So that's one type of great way to use a heat map or even just looking at a click heat map to see what are your top elements on your pages and then putting in some filters. So if I know where do people click the most on this page, is that true for both desktop and mobile users? Is it true for people, true for people who came from Google PPC versus people who came from other sources? Okay, the next question that I see is coming in. Uh, it says, I'm still stuck on dynamic heat maps. Uh, so yeah, the difference between what a dynamic heat map is, and I appreciate you uh, having me explain it, is that traditionally, if you've ever worked with heat maps in the past, they were static images or JPEGs. And this became very challenging to work with modern websites because you maybe had a lot of mobile visitors interacting with um, hamburger menus that expand, or maybe you had a lot of hover over content. So it became very difficult to run heat maps on these type of hidden elements. What a dynamic heat map will do is actually allow you to interact with the page so you can get to sub navigations and sub menus and see these interaction points all through heat maps. So that's why we call it a dynamic heat map because your website itself and visitor experience is very dynamic. So we want our heat map technology to be the same. Really great question. I appreciate it having me clarify. I'm scrolling through a question here. Uh, th and this, uh, another question came in that I often hear a lot is, well, when is the right time to introduce a tool? Uh, I'm thinking about launching a new website, but I have this existing website. Shouldn't I wait till this new website's up and running and I'm getting traffic to it? And while it is exciting to get the new website out there and get traffic to it, you often want to learn from your existing user behaviors. Understand what's working well where are people getting frustrated and use this to make informed decisions as you're building this new website. Because otherwise you're gonna come out with a really good looking website that's very flashy, very modern, but you're 
not benefiting from the fact that you have a lot of good data and insights at your fingertips. So we always recommend get any sort of tracking on there immediately and use these to make these informed changes. Good. Well, I know we're near time here and uh, it's probably even lunchtime for some of you. So again, I, I want to tremendously thank you all for your time for uh, sticking around and answering and asking some good questions. Uh, our team is always available at Lucky Orange. That's why we post our phone number there. So if you didn't have an opportunity to ask a question or if I didn't get to answer it, please feel free to email us directly or call us in and tweet at us. But uh, I want to thank you all. And for those uh, in town, have a great long Labor Day weekend. Awesome. Thank you all so much for joining today's webinar. And thank you so much, Danny, for your awesome information. I really appreciated all of it. As a reminder, we will be sending out the replay of the video and the PDF of the slides. So look out for that. Um, other than that, we hope to see you next month for our next Master Your Marketing Series presentation with Woo Rank. So again, thank you and have a great Labor Day weekend.